Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and today we are continuing Guy Talk Hour Two. I've got my power panel; they haven't budged. I've got Dr. <laughs> Greg B, Tom P, and Jeff Verdorn. So that's the team. <laughs> Any questions you have, uh, you text the questions over, and they will do their best to answer your question. I also welcome comments if you have a comment. But eight seven seven nine three three two four eight four is the number. I think we should start off with a little controversial topic, gentlemen, in this hour. We're getting things started. What does the Bible say about divorce and remarriage? I will be in the other room if you need me. (laughs) (laughs) So that's that's kind of a can of worms within the church. There's a lot of different views, generally speaking, and I'm going to speak on kind of the evangelical side. Um, The Bible describes two clear um, examples where uh, divorce is allowed, not encouraged. God hates divorce, Scripture says, and he, he doesn't recommend it ever. Uh, what he has brought together, let no man tear apart, but he allows it in two cases. One is sexual immorality, and that's in Matthew uh, chapter 5. And the other that's talked about is an abandonment by one of the spouses uh, by an unbeliever. It's actually kind of specific. And there are a lot of churches that say those are the only biblical grounds for divorce, and therefore if you were to divorce and try to get remarried, those are the only conditions uh, in which some many churches in the evangelical world would uh, allow or permit or, or do the marriage. The, this is a tough one, because what about abuse and abusive relationships. And it's it's like that's not specifically outlined in Scripture, but I can't imagine where we want to force someone to stay with someone who is abusive in some way. And I don't, I guess my personal opinion, and, and, and this is not my church's actually, so I, I better, better be careful here. I think there's a little more grace in this whole marriage thing, especially when you have abusive relationships. Now, it's not a license to just do whatever you want like the world says. But I think there's some more cases. I don't know. You guys? It's a tough topic. Uh, I hate divorce. I do everything I can to reconcile people. I believe in reconciliation, but I am with all of you guys in this sense. There are factors out there that do play into relationships, and we have to take those seriously. I was mentioning my mother uh, long before I was born. I was married to another man. So I have a brother that's 10 years older than I am and a sister five. When she was pregnant for my sister, he took her, this is during World War II, he took her to Lake Erie one day and drowned her. What? He drowned her. He took her out in the water. Nobody was on the beach. It was a Tuesday. He took her out in the water and he put her under the water and held her under until she didn't breathe anymore. By the Lord's grace, who comes walking along the beach but an emergency room nurse and her husband, he panics, pulls mom up out of the water and said, my wife is drowning. Help me, help me. That nurse worked on her for 20 minutes to bring her back. Oh, my goodness. And she came back and gave birth to my sister a little bit later. She divorced him because she was terrified of him. After the war ended, about two years later, my dad comes home from World War II, meets my mom. They never went on a date, but after three months, he said, Alice, will you marry me? And she said, well, can I think about it? And so he pulled out a chair and sat down. And then I came along four years later. So even in the midst of the, the issues... There is, the Lord's grace is there. And if you, look, it is always the Lord's will we stay together. It is always the Lord's will mm-hmm. we work it out. But when you have one that isn't going to do that and is going to be abusive, and I've hidden many abused women uh, in our church. I have hidden them, put them in houses, put them with other people to where the, the spouse could not find them until they received counseling or they were held accountable for what they were doing. So it's a tricky one. Yeah, I have a similar story. My mother, when she was young, worked as a maid in a wealthy person's home, and she was married young. And this husband of hers was terribly abusive, the same situation. And she couldn't take it any longer, and she ended up uh, suing for divorce. 
And so she met my father later on, and same story, Tom. She became pregnant and and had four children, and I was one of them. I wouldn't be here today if it hadn't been for the relationship between my mother and my father. Mm. So that, I'm not trying to justify divorce, but I agree with you, uh, both of you, about the abuse. The, anybody can finally repent and change their ways by the grace of God. But during that process, if that's ever going to happen, there's no reason to go ahead and submit to being abused. And sometimes the only recourse you have is divorce. So um, I know that might not sit well with a lot of folks, but I agree with you, Hmm. Jeff, about God's grace. I think it's larger than that. It isn't just because, well, we have irreconcilable differences. Um, If it's an abusive situation, and certainly, Tom, your story is illustrative of that, I, I don't see the other option. I'm really glad both of you guys are here, by the way. Thank you. We <laughs> oh are, too. Oh, my goodness. Those are powerful stories. Mm. All right, gentlemen. Uh, Saul prayed to God, but he didn't get an answer, so he called on a medium. Per Saul's request, she summoned Samuel. The medium said, I see a spirit ascending from the underground. Samuel said, why have you disturbed me by calling me? My question is, why didn't Samuel descend from heaven? heaven rather than ascend from the underground. Oh, well, this is the idea that before the cross, there was a place where both the righteous and the unrighteous went. In the Old Testament, it's called Sheol, which is often translated as the grave. In the New Testament, it is described as Hades. So in Luke 16, we have the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Mm -hmm. Both of them descended into Hades, but there's two sides. There's a good side, the bosom of Abraham or the place of comfort or paradise. And there's the bad side, a place of torment uh, or being in agony. And in fact, when the thief said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, and he said, today you'll be with me in paradise, uh, I think scripture says that Jesus went down to the bosom of Abraham, the good side of Hades. After the cross... All those on the good side, he sets the captives free. They are brought up to heaven. And now when the righteous die, we no longer go to the good side of Hades. We go to paradise, which is in heaven, the third heaven, the throne of God, where Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. So Paul clearly says, absent from the body, at home with the Lord. All right. Uh, Let's see. In Exodus Chapter 4, verse 24, why did the Lord almost put Moses to death? Exodus, say that again. Exodus 4, 24, why did the Lord almost put Moses to death? I think if you didn't look it up, you could just say, why did the Lord almost put Moses to death? Because he didn't obey. One of the ways in which I... I understand that Moses was given significant authority. It says in James chapter 3, verse 1, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So the greater responsibility, the greater authority, the greater influence you have, um, there's going to be a greater strictness applied to the exercise of those gifts. So I think that Moses had that authority, and even what would appear to be something minor, striking a rock, um, he's held accountable by God because of what he modeled for all of those in which he was leading. Nicely done, Greg B. Mm -hmm. All right, anybody else? I've never really studied this, so I don't I don't okay. have anything else. All right. Here's another question, follow-up to our question we just had about divorce and remarriage. I have a friend who had a divorce <clears throat> only because his wife wanted to, and he's convinced he can't remarry because it would be unbiblical. True? <laughs> Theologically, let's, let's go back for a second. Theologically, and we say it over and over and over here again, 
When you have surrendered the blood of Jesus, there is no sin after that that will eliminate you from the kingdom of God. Mm. So we're not talking a salvation issue here. Mm. In his case, the Lord may want him to stay single for his own reasons. I don't know how old he is and if the wife has divorced him, but there may come along another woman, and like Greg and I, they may foster children who wind up serving the kingdom of God. So I don't get too concerned about that end of it because we're not talking salvation here. We're talking, are we being obedient to the Lord? And in some cases, uh, it is disobedient to do that. In other cases, it is obedient. It's hard without all the information. Was she a believer or an unbeliever? If she was an unbeliever and she abandoned him, walked away, wanted the divorce, then I would argue clearly Scripture, that's one of the conditions or descriptions in the Bible that where God does specifically allow a remarriage. Um, So, you know, I I think it's good to, to go back a little bit and talk about God's relationship with Israel. And he's, he never divorces Israel, even though they were unfaithful to him. They committed spiritual adultery against God, just as God allows a divorce when, when there's marital infidelity or adultery in a physical way, so too Israel committed spiritual adultery with God, and yet he didn't divorce them. Right. But he's God. He's God. I think he knows how painful that unfaithfulness is. And so in this world, he says, that's one of the conditions that I will allow it. Uh, Was there marital unfaithfulness in this relationship? I don't think we have enough information to give advice to him. All right. Gentlemen, what about suicide and your salvation? Well, this goes right back to the heart of several of the questions today, that once you're born again, you're saved. You have your your eternal. You're born again, you receive the Holy Spirit for all of eternity, and uh, that he holds his your salvation in his hands, shielded by his power until that day. This is the idea of assurance of salvation. So in other words, you cannot sin or out-sin God's grace of salvation. So that includes the sin of murder or even the sin of, of, of killing yourself. I really quick story, I had a... Um, a fraternity brother, two fraternity brothers, one was Catholic and one was evangelical. He was a believer. And the evangelical Christian ended up killing himself. He had issues early on in his life uh, and and committed suicide. My other good friend is Catholic. And we had a lot of good conversations because in Catholicism, if you commit suicide, it can, you kind of disqualify yourself from heaven. And it was a number of powerful conversations to explain God's plan of salvation and that what he saves and what he makes new and what he declares as righteous uh, will be righteous for all of eternity. You know, the other thing we've got to think about, and oftentimes when I hear about, we just heard recently about a a golfer, PGA golfer who took his life. Um, What we don't generally give consideration to is the damage that people who are living after a person commits suicide experience. The consequences of suicide has ramifications all throughout a family. And so consequently, there's huge uh, problems that are experienced by people who survive somebody who commits suicide. So it, it, I can understand why it is a sin, but like you, we've said, there's no sin that will keep you from the throne of grace and uh, will impact your salvation. None. But this is the step where the church has to become more active in terms of how we interact with one another. Most of the people I've counseled only think about suicide when they get isolated from other people. Mm. The devil loves to isolate people. You know, you sit in your house and you cry. You don't go out. You don't interact. And that's where as Christians, uh, one of the reasons I love having, we have seven home churches in our church. So they meet during the week on a regular basis. They have dinner together. They study the Bible together. There are about 10 or 12 in each group. The advantage is real simple. Now, not everybody's in it, but we're trying to get them all in there. The advantage is they can't hide from one another. And if they're not there, somebody's calling them Mm. and saying, Jeff, we're going to come over. What's going on? Why aren't you here with us? We get isolated, and as a result, suicide becomes very easy. The voices become very easy that you're worthless. You're never going to amount to anything. Why are you still here? And I've seen too many suicides, and I buried people that committed suicide, and it's heartbreaking. You know, that's that's a really good word, by the way. I think we should just pause for a second. 
if if anybody listening is having some of those feelings that you were just describing, f- find some v- solid biblical believers, find a church, find a group of people that love the Lord, draw near to God. He will draw near to you and find other believers that you can share your, your troubles, your concerns, your, your, you know, whatever you have going, find a group of believers that yes, you can share yes. that with. I, yes, I, good word. I find I cannot judge somebody for committing suicide because of the terrible carnage that depression brings upon somebody's life. I'm not, I have not experienced that, but I know people had. I had a counselor friend, a strong Christian, who was a supporter of mine for a long, long time, ended up taking his life. Hmm. And uh, the fact of the matter is he was suffering terribly under depression. There would be highs and there would be lows. So, I, you know, I, I don't think we fully understand the depths of depression. And uh, so we can't judge somebody. You know, the theme of this show today is you cannot out God's grace. Yeah. Well said, Jeff. Hmm. Erdorn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll take a break. Be right back. More Guy Talk or Guys Who Talk. 877-933-2484 is the number to text your question in. There's lots of great questions here. We'll get right back to them. Hi, podcast listener. You know, I'm Bill Arnold, and my theme song says, What's for Dinner?, And like when I'm grilling, I'm paying really close attention. And I know that ideal second to get the food off the grill. Like all good and ideal timings in life, right now would be an ideal time to be a cheerful giver to Faith Radio. Give now to support this podcast so that more people in more places might come to saving faith in Jesus and grow in their relationship and become a fully devoted follower. Click the link in the show notes or give now at myfaithradio.com. Dot com. Welcome back to the show. Guy talker, guys who talk. I've got Greg B, Tom P, Jeff V. That's the team. They're here to take your questions and answer them promptly and swiftly. They've got their Bibles open and ready to go. 877-933-2484. Again, 877-933-2484. Eight four. All right. Second Chronicles twenty eight and twenty nine. King Ahaz was twenty when he became became king of Judah and ruled sixteen years, dying at age thirty six. His son Hezekiah was twenty five when he became king. That means Ahaz was only eleven when he fathered Hezekiah. Did boys father children that early in those days? Is that right? I've I've done the whole chart at one time with kind of ages of kings and so on and when they ruled and reigned. I don't remember that. Okay. Do you guys remember that? No. I don't. Maybe there was a... I'm not saying we've been stumped, but that is a little bit of a tricky well, question. Maybe we have been stumped here. I don't think so. Like my chart. Interesting question, though. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I'm not sure about that at all. Yep. All right. Well, Jeff, you can keep looking for that, and I'll move on to another question. All right. Yeah. Uh, do you, were you going to say something, Greg? Oh, it, it goes back, actually, to the discussion about divorce. I don't know if we want to, to continue that. I just have to explain what happened to me. Uh, when my father divorced my mother, I was 12 years of age. I'm talking about the consequences of divorce, and so that's why we have to think soberly about divorce. I had to stand in front of a judge with my mother on the left side, my father on the right side, and the judge asked me, who was I, did I want to live with at 12 years of age? I couldn't answer. I, nothing came out, and the judge pointed his finger at me. I'll never forget this. He says, hurry up, son. We haven't got all day. I ran out of that courthouse... And at the top of the stair was a cement lion on each side. And I put my arms around that lion, and I said, I will never allow anyone to ever control my life again. And that was the end of my childhood at 12 years of age. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm sorry that happened. Yeah, Mm -hmm. me too. Wow. You know, you said this earlier that divorce is costly in this world. There are huge consequences and uh, maybe right now there's a couple that is struggling. Um, I think one of the best admonitions, if you're struggling right now, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church mm-hmm. and gave himself up for her. Love her. 
Husbands, love your wives. Wives, it says, submit to your husbands as one would submit to the Lord. Now, some take that submission as a bad word. Christ submitted perfectly to the Father. That's a beautiful picture. And in fact, in this Ephesians passage, in Ephesians chapter 5 that I'm describing, this whole section about husbands and wives begins with this, submit to one another then as to the Lord um, and pray together. If you're not praying together, pray together. Draw near to God. As you and your spouse draw near to God, you'll draw near to each other as well. What I've seen over and over in divorce or whatever, started with my dad, who at nine was orphaned. He was the oldest of four. Mom and dad and grandma and grandpa were killed in a car train wreck. And so the family was split up immediately. And this is 1932, I think, something like that. My dad lived to 86. There was not a single day in his life He didn't start the day asking, what if, and if only? What if I had been there? If only this wouldn't have happened. Mm. And you can see how that haunts people. Divorce does the same thing. And that's why it is critically important that that especially young people in the family are listened to and talked to because they're carrying a burden they don't know what to do with. And unfortunately, often it goes into adulthood and it goes into other relationships and they don't mean it, but it just happens. All right. Thank you for that, Tom P. All right. uh, Somebody, I think my friend Lee here said, I I think what I heard is that when Luther left the church, he believed in a few things that most Protestants do not believe in now, one being the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. So the question is, when did this change? Well, I don't know about the... If Martin Luther believed in the presence, the Catholic Church believes that the actual the wafer and the blood actually become the body and the blood of Christ without appearing to be flesh and blood. That's called transubstantiation. Protestantism, Lutheranism, tends to have consubstantiation, that the presence of Christ is with the bread and the wine. Most evangelicals uh, don't believe in either of transubstantiation or consubstantiation. Right. They just believe that you do this in remembrance of Christ's crucifixion, and it it's, it's just stays bread and and wine. I, do you know the history of Luther and whether or not he what he believed on that? Because I think that started with Luther. It did. And it's, well, the early Protestants, many of them moved toward that because the Roman Catholic Church in transubstantiation. Uh, connected it with the authority of the church and also with the building of St. Peter's Cathedral, which had a lot to do with money and people with lighting indulgences candles and stuff. with indulgences. Yeah. Uh, Luther pretty much came out on uh, the real presence, that for the moment you take it, you know, it, it's really the real presence of Jesus there, his body and his blood. It's not just symbolic. It's just not a nice memory. It's real. I know others go with just remembrance. The point is, how do we recognize Jesus in the bread and the wine? And are we doing it just as a remembrance that, yeah, you did this 2,000 years ago, or is there any real power there for people? Well, I think that's up to the Lord. I'm not always sure what that means myself as a pastor, Uh, but I do encourage, and Luther did encourage people to take seriously when they take their bread and the wine, not to take it in a frivolous manner or to underestimate the presence of Jesus. So, and it's kind of like the presence of Jesus. Where did Jesus say the kingdom of God is? It's in you you know, which is a whole new concept for people. So the presence with was there in the Protestant Reformation from the very beginning. That was one of the things that Luther was protesting against the Catholic Church, if you will. He was, his 95 Thesis basically was debate, and it stemmed from the indulgences. I always love Luther's quote. He said, first of all, I don't believe in indulgences. I don't believe the Pope has the authority to forgive indulgences. And if he did, he should empty the place free of charge. So that that was really the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, the Wittenberg door. But out of that then, they began to question many things, and not in terms of rebellion. I think Luther really saw himself as a Roman Catholic to the day he died, even well, he, though he didn't got he want, married. Didn't he want to reform the he church? He did. He wanted to reform in the church because he felt they had strayed off of biblical teaching. And he was saying, unless you can prove to me from Scripture that this is true, I cannot and I will not recant. I read on a Catholic website that the, there were rogue priests that were asking for indulgences and, and the Vatican were violently against it. That it were rogue priests that were doing that, that and the Catholic Church did not believe in it. No. 
No, it was sanctioned by the Catholic Church. The Pope sanctioned it. Yeah. We okay. actually have documentation on that. So I can't believe everything I read <laughs> on the Internet? What on the internet. Shock. That's why we're here, Bill. <laughs> oh, you, guys, you guys are so helpful on occasion. All right. Uh, Jeff, I'm looking your direction. Israel is God's people. Every citizen of the nation of Israel formed in 1948 does not believe in God. So is it possible that the government nation of Israel is not the biblical Israel? So let's separate out the current government, the state of Israel, and the people who are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all right? Mm -hmm. So in order to be a Jew, you have to be a descendant of, of Jacob. How the current government works, I, I'll, I'll never be an apologist for the government of Israel, but God has made a promise that the descendants of Jacob uh, will, will never cease to be a nation before him, are the apple of his eye, um, that his gift and his calls that he made to Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are irrevocable. And one of those is that they would possess the land forever. And that is going to prove true. Revelation, uh, Romans chapter 11 makes it abundantly clear. Has God rejected his people? By no means. And later in Romans 11, it says, and therefore all Israel will be saved. When the deliverer will come from Zion, he will turn godlessness away from Jacob on that day that he takes away their sins. So there's a future for Israel, the people uh, that are there, not the nation, but the people that are there, the Jewish people that are there, uh, are still God's elect. They're still God's chosen people. And he's not done with them yet. And there's some saved Jews, Messianic Jews. Oh, yeah. It's not They're all of Israel is, is, are, are, don't believe in God. So there's about six and a half million Jews, seven million Jews in Israel. There's only about 30 or 40,000 born again Jews in Israel. Now in the United States, there's about the same number of Jews and there's about a million Jews who are born again in the United States. So those are about the numbers. Remember today, Wait. Israel still is in unbelief, right? Now, generally mm -hmm. speaking, they are still uh, hardened, the hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles comes in. Uh, they are enemies on account of the gospel, but still chosen by God or part of the elect, meaning they're, they're the branches that have been broken off in unbelief. But one day, God says, they will be grafted in again. Let me push this just a little further. Israel, uh, yes, I do believe what you're saying. I have no issue with that. The problem is, among most evangelicals, what I'm hearing is, even though they don't come right out and say it, is God has a separate plan for Israel because there's the chosen people, and then he has a plan for the Christians. And I don't see that in the New Testament. It's all one. The Jews who will be redeemed and come in at the end will also be Jews who surrender to Jesus as Lord and King. But I know right now in Israel, and I have people over there uh, doing ministry, and you've been there, Jeff, and I don't know how many times you've been there, but there are segments of it, especially among some of the Orthodox Jews, that literally spit on Christians when they talk about Jesus and put them down. Now, does Jesus still love those people? Of course he does. Does he still have a plan? Of course he does. But they still need Jesus. And so we don't want to separate that it's one plan for Israel and a, another plan for the Gentiles. So Romans makes it very clear that all are under sin. Yep. Both Jew and Gentile alike all need to believe right now today in this age of grace, whether you're Jew or Gentile, the only path of salvation is through faith in the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. But there is when, when, when Jesus comes back, at his second coming, when all Israel will be saved, I think a remnant of Israel, they will look upon him who they have pierced, and they will finally, finally recognize in faith yeah, like you just yeah. described. So remember, some in Christianity want to uh, uh, describe it what's called a dual covenant theology, where there's a this separate past for Israel and that they don't need to preach the gospel to the Jews. That is just wrong. I don't think that's biblical at all. All right, we're going to take a little break and come back with your question, 877-933-2484. It's Guy Talk or Guys Who Talk. We'll be right back. It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Drive time, drive time. Let's get it started. Jump in your car. Yeah. What's for dinner? It's the afternoon show with Bill Arno. Welcome back to the show. If you just tuned in, we're having guy talk or guys who talk, which means it's a Q and A. You ask the questions, and they do their very best. I think they've only been stumped once today, so 
Uh, no pizza again forever. <laughs> <laughs> forever? Well, that's a little harsh, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. When you told me second Tuesday from never, I believed you. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you were right about that one. <laughs> All right, I'm trying to find my... Where'd that one question go, Wyatt, about the f- first John chapter 2? If You can find that one. There it is. Thank you, Wyatt. You're so fast. Uh, what does first... John 2, 3 to 4 mean, and I've got it here. It says, uh, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. So the question is, uh, if a person is saved, even if they keep a lie and never confess it to anyone other than God. Remember the original question about can you lose your salvation? Now, we discussed that part, but what about this command that this verse shares, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4? So let's, let's set a foundation here that we all know, and we've as we've just talked about today, actually a few times, that salvation is by faith and by faith alone. And then once you're saved, you have assurance of salvation. Okay, with that foundation, go ahead, guys. <laughs> Well, that was nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you if you look at this, if you think of commands as like the Ten Commandments, well, Jesus summarized the Ten Commandments in two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body. Love your neighbor as yourself. We are not talking, and this is, I've got to put this, I've got to put John 17, 3 in here. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Christianity is a relationship. It is not a set of commands. The commands give us boundaries, like being on a racetrack with boundaries on each side. And I don't care who the best race car driver is, they hit those boundaries every once in a while. When you hit the boundaries, you need to come back to the middle. And that's where you come back and you renew yourself to Jesus. Um, So I think it's talking here about the relationship more than keeping a set of commands, because the relationship is in the commands to love the Lord and to love one another. You know, what's interesting to note is that all of the commands except one has been repeated repeatedly in the New Testament yes. by Paul and others. The Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. About. Yeah. yeah, the Ten Commandments. So we're no longer underneath the weight that drove us to the cross. What we see in the commandments is the character of God. Yeah. And so consequently, those commands are good for us, not just, as you pointed out, Tom, about making sure that we stay stay on the track, but they represent the character of God, and we're to be on his ambassadors. So those commands will help us in terms of our character, and that's why they're still important. Yeah, I think uh, I'm going to go to John 6, 29. Jesus answered them and said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So in the end, the the greatest uh, obedience, the 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 singular command that we are to obey in order to be saved for salvation is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's work to believe in him whom he has sent. Now that, so that's the question, what must I do to be saved? Now we have this question, how now shall I live? Mm -hmm. And if you're just going to go and break all the commands, uh, you know, and live like the world, uh, you know, God says, well, yeah, God may, you might be saved, but you're still living like the world. Remember, he got after the Corinthians this way, yeah. right? He says, you're still acting worldly. You're still acting carnally. You're saved, but you're still living like the world. So is this a command to be obedient to all the commands that God has given us? No, I think it's a, it's something that says, if you are abiding in him, your life will start reflecting more and more of God's ways. Do we not lie because of the command, do not lie? Or do we not lie because the God of truth is dwelling within us? You know, uh, you had mentioned a little while ago, Tom, uh, uh, about this issue of loving God. You can say, I really love the Lord. Well, your life should certainly demonstrate that. The way in which we show our love for God is not just verbally proclaiming that we love him as an emotion— Um, Because that emotion, you're not led by emotions. What it really means to love God is to obey him. Yes. Obedience will always produce strength. Disobedience will always produce weakness. Good point. And and I think that's what uh, 
First uh, James 1 says, it says, be doers of the word. Don't just be hearers of it, but yeah. put it into practice. Live it out. Yes. All right, gentlemen. 877-933-2484. Here's my next question. Did God create everything in Genesis, or was that just when he created the earth and everything in it? Satan had already rebelled since he was tempting Eve, so that seems like the angels were already created before God made the world. Well, mm -hmm. long discussion, but uh, for me, um, I think Scripture in Genesis chapter 1 says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, all things were made, space, time, matter, and what I think, what science has discovered was a big bang, however long ago, it doesn't really matter, but God made everything with the breath of his mouth, boom, everything came into existence. And then about 6,000 years ago, according to the genealogies, God takes this void planet, this is verse 2, and the earth was void and shapeless and darkness covered the spirit, uh, the, the covered the deep. And, and he takes this, this hunk of rock, third from the sun, and in six literal days, I think they are literal days, he shapes this hunk of rock into a, a garden in which he puts man on the sixth day. In that model, if you will, um, what this question is very astute because I think Satan did exist long ago. And in fact, Job, it says that the, says the angels were there when he set the foundations of the, of the earth. Mm -hmm. So I think that the angels could have been, been made long ago. The universe could have been made long ago. But about 6,000 years ago, God put something very special on this hunk of rock, and that's called man, in which he wants to have a relationship with. Can I ask you a question, yeah. Jeff, on what you just said? If the sun and the moon were not created until, what is it, third day? Fourth day. Fourth day. How could there be a literal day before that? Yeah, well, we have this conundrum that day one says there was evening and morning the first day. And then day two says there was evening and morning the second day. Yeah. And so I actually think that the, the our Earth, our solar system, our galaxy, and everything was there prior to these six days of creation. Uh, because of things like, look, this is, I do a whole semester class on creation, so it's it's kind of like, uh, I get the young earth creation view, by the way. The young earth creation view says that everything in the whole universe came into existence about 6,000 years ago in these six literal days. And the argument goes that that's the only literal interpretation. Well, you guys know me. I take a very literalistic view of scripture, yeah. um, and, and I want to understand it properly. I've come to the conclusion that the question of how old Adam is is a separate question to how old the rocks are underneath his feet. And I'm lockstep in agreement with all the young earth creationists that says the universe that Adam came into existence about 6,000 years ago in six literal days, just as Genesis describes, but that the universe can be older than that. And that's where I diverge a little mm -hmm. bit from the young earth mm -hmm. creationist. Does that make sense? Yes, it okay. does. Thank you. Yeah, I just had a guest on the show last week, and it was a fascinating uh, conversation. Helmut Welk. And if you check that out on the podcast, he discussed all of this. You can check that out at myfaithradio.com. What did he conclude, if I can ask? Um, well, he, he used some fancy words that I can't remember right now. Was it magnetic something... Uh, there's there's 95 different ways to test the age of the earth. Yeah. And like almost 98% say that it's a young a younger earth. Young earth. Yeah, it's a younger Thousands earth. of years. Yeah, but it, it's the it, it, they do the 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 CO the CO14 or the carbon carbon, carbon, carbon 14. 14 testing and yeah. and also the magnetic resonance. I can't does that sound right, Wyatt? A lot like of scientific magnetic language. something. Yeah. I mean, I was paying attention. You were paying well, attention. Well, I was too, but <laughs> yeah. it was a while ago, like you said. So. Well, there's yeah, some very smart people who have looked at a lot of these uh, kind of ob observations of the universe of creation and, and have come to the conclusion that you can see these things in a young Earth creation model, a young universe creation model. There are the others that look at the universe and say, well, wait a minute. There's some very simple... Uh, things that we can observe, such as many stars are millions of light years away. In other words, the light that we are seeing today 
took millions of years to get here. So if the universe is only 6,000 years old, how did that light spend the last... Which goes back to your explanation. It, which the young earth creationists would say he created the stars and he created the light in between the stars and the earth, giving it an appearance of age without actually being old, right? So that would be the young earth uh, creationist explanation. I think the crown jewel on top of all of this, Genesis, wherever we talk about, it, is that where you, that's where you get the statement, God created them in his image, male and female. He doesn't talk about animals that way. He doesn't talk about the creation that way. He talks about people. And I think that that's the, I'm a young earth person in that sense. But the point of it is, we have a responsibility because we've been created in his image and we are to reflect him now in this world. Do we do it well? Not often. But that's why we need a savior. And that's why we have one. And regardless of how old the rocks are, of what you believe about the age of the rocks, we know this that nothing was made that was made without God. Things seen or unseen, right. God made it all. And there is no life that exists without God. He is the author of all life, including people who he made in Him in his image, body, soul, and spirit, and desires that none should perish and wants to have a relationship with every single one. All right, we're doing our very best to figure everything out today. <laughs> and we'll be back after a short break. If you have a question for the guy, panel 877-933-2484. If you'd like to know more about what it means to begin a relationship with Christ or to chat with someone about it, just text the word FAITH to 41224. Oh, that was a lively conversation we had during the break. I'm sorry you didn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you guys still like each other after this hour. Anyway, yes. we are uh, looking forward to hearing from you. 877-933-2484. Tetragrammaton. Would you please talk about that and its, its importance in Scripture? Well, that's the Y-H-W-H. Yep. That's the Hebrew name for God. That's the name that... God said, when Moses asked, what should, what's your name? Who should I say sent me? And he said, I am that I am. And that's where we get this, what what we pronounce as Yahweh, even though there's no uh, vowels. Uh, some use the phrase Je, um, Jehovah or Yahweh. They're the same words. They both come from this tetra. What was then the question? What did he ask about? Yeah, how does it fit into scripture? Oh, it's well. It's the it's the covenant name of of God. I am. I am the eternal one. I am the existent one. And uh, so, whether you pronounce it Yahweh or Jehovah, uh, that's where we get it from. This Y H W H, uh, the English transliteration of the the Hebrew letters that make up that name. Hmm. All right. Uh, did I read it wrong that the Israelites left Israel and went to Egypt? Then the Palestinians took over Israel. And when the Israel people came back for their land and fought the Palestines for it, Palestinians. Palestinians. Yeah. No, there, there. <laughs> so there actually was no Palestinians right. in those days. Um, they, Abraham was given the land of Canaan, in which there was a whole bunch of ites, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the mosquito bites, a whole bunch of these people <laughs> that that lived there. They were then sent away to Egypt. And then back to the land, and God says, you need to clear the land. He asked them to clear the land because he knew that if they left them in the land, that their daughters would marry their sons and they would cause them to follow after false gods. So that's why he clears the land. The name Palestine didn't come until millennium later when Israel, the nation of Israel, after being ruled by all these kings and prophets and thousands of years of history, a couple of temples on the Temple Mount and so on in the land of Israel, the Romans kicked the Israel out of their land. That's right. And they renamed mm -hmm. Israel Philistia after their arch enemies, the Philistines, in 135 AD. That later became Palestine. And so for 2,000 years, it was called Palestine. But Palestine is Israel. Now, there are Arabs who lived in Palestine, and there were Jews that lived in Palestine. So there really is no people uh, historically called the Palestinians. They're Arabs. That's that's what they are. And when, by the way, when in the Balfour Declaration in 1917 and then the formation of the state of Israel in 1948, Palestine was divided into two 
Oh, there's your two-state solution, by the way, an Arab Palestine and a Jewish Palestine. And they said, because there's Arabs and Jews living here, we want them to live at peace with one another. So Arabs, you'll have this part. In fact, it was two-thirds of Palestine. Mm -hmm. And Jews, you have this part, about one-third of Palestine. Uh, But the world has never really truly accepted that, even though the U.N. gave them state status on May 14th, 1948, the nation of Israel was born and has not only a God-given right to be there to that land, but also has a U.N., a world-declared right to be in that land. All right. Let's see here. This question, we're having trouble uh, talking to uh, a father who doesn't seem to care about the topic of God at all. How do you help someone realize the importance of salvation? And when you die, then you face eternity. First, you have to be praying for them. I mean, what they what, what you have to understand is that there is a um, God has placed eternity into each person's soul yet, not so that he knows what God's done from the beginning to the end. That was ordained by God. That was God's perfect will. And so you look at Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says, that's exactly what it says. God placed eternity, and it compels us to ask questions about, why am I here? Am I making any progress? And will I do have any lasting impact? So you have to rely on the fact that God gave people a sense of the eternal. And then the second thing we have to realize is it's not our job to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's the Holy Spirit's job, according to John 16, 8. So you have to rely on that fact. And so going into a discussion with them, you have to pray with them. You answer questions that they're asking or you question answers that they're giving, and you leave the conversion to God. You may be just taking them one step closer to considering the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to be satisfied with that. I think most of us don't take the time, like you're talking about, Greg, to really talk with somebody to really talk to where they begin to share their heart or their real feelings. And it's appropriate. I'm very much for listening. I teach that all the time. It's appropriate to ask questions. Well, Dad, how did you come to this conclusion? Mm -hmm. You know, what brought you to that? And usually dads or others will kind of go around, you know, like a carousel on the outside, not get the real issue. And then you say, well, Dad, when did this start? And then all of a sudden you find out it started when he was a kid and they went to church and the pastor ran off with his mom. And he got very bitter at the church at that point and basically wrote off all of Christianity. Now, that's not fair because you and I know church is made up of people and people do some pretty bad things, but that's not Jesus. And so when I've had a chance to talk with these kind of men and women, that's usually where we ultimately wind up. It's it's usually some story in the past. They got hurt Mm -hmm. and and they could never sort it out. And they're angry at God over what happened to their parents. And I let them tell me, and then I try to talk to them about how much the Lord still loves them and how much he wants them to know him. And sometimes I've seen it overnight literally change. Sometimes it took years, and sometimes it's never happened as far as I know. Yeah. All right, my last question, gentlemen, and and this is about making a true disciple. Um, If the disciple you make doesn't make a disciple, have you really made a disciple? (laughs) 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 Well, it goes back to this whole idea about this multiplication principle. If you go ahead and disciple one person, that person will disciple another, right. and it'll grow exponentially. I, I don't look at it mathematically like that. I just look at it. You make a disciple who is a follower of Jesus Christ. What they do with their life from that point on is between them and God. They may make another disciple, but you haven't failed no. Because you made the disciple or worked with the disciple and they didn't disciple someone else. Great answer. What a great way to end the, the hour. Thank you for that, Dr. Greg Borgon. All right, gentlemen, you guys uh, really did well today, except that one question you didn't get. So <laughs> I don't know why I'm bringing you know, that up again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Twice we've heard that already. <laughs> really? Really? I'm smelling no pizza for a while. <laughs> I thought we live by grace around here. You do? <laughs> Not you do? the letter yeah. of the law. Yeah. 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 But thank you so much for your participation and, and being here and present and taking on all these great questions. Thank you so much for asking all the great questions. That means uh, so much to us. Uh, and I hope you have a wonderful night. God bless you, and I'll see you tomorrow.
Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.